Hello, everybody, and welcome to Table Takes. Today is December 18th, the week before Xmas. How's everybody doing? I hope I hope you're all uh, doing great. And also, we have a new but familiar fa- face here today. Hello, Abby. How are Hello. you? How are you? What has been happening with you lately? Uh, so I got the opportunity to uh, direct my own film two weekends ago. Um, and it was a very, very scary experience, um, but it was great telling people what to do. So <laughs> um, I hope we made magic. And there was a couple of times where we had all of the crew on set crying from what the actors did um, because it was very, very heartfelt. Um, it has everything to do with COVID and the protests all in one 18 minute short. <laughs> that's, that's, and that's climate change. Oh, that's too much to handle. <laughs> like, good thing you got through the filming process with that kind yeah. of like, yeah, <laughs> subject. Oh man, but exciting, very. So exciting. When, when and where are we gonna, gonna be able to see it? Yeah. Um. So it is now in post production, right? So that's gonna at least be three months, um, because you know indie films. Uh. So definitely summer of 2021. Um. It's gonna make the the film festival market. So I'll definitely let you guys know as soon as uh, it gets up. I'm pretty sure it'll get accepted into a film festival, knocking on wood, but I'm pretty sure. It's a very powerful piece. So I'm super excited to see what happens in editing. You'll have to let us know when, so that we can uh, inform our many, many viewers that they should go see it. I will definitely do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, speaking of things like just getting finished up and also another uh, director themselves, Isabella, how about that? Um, Oh, also, I have a message from you from Emma, and it goes like this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That was the message from Emma. I'm not sure that you blushed enough to really. Was that that in reference to something? (laughs) Emma has sent me a message to tell you. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Uh, she and was then... just very excited about your play. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Your play Emma. was amazing. Ah, thank you. Uh, we're in the final weekend uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to strike um, when I can um, rest, sleep. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I watched The Muppet Christmas Carol this past weekend, this past week, uh, which was really great. Um, and I cannot, I'm really looking forward to, um, getting superpowers on the 21st. And if you don't <laughs> understand that joke, it's not for you. <laughs> but some of us are very excited about getting superpowers. Um, so I can't wait for that. I am hoping for telekinesis or invisibility. Yes. That's, those are my two big ones. Um, telekinesis, invisibility. I will also take time travel though. Not we'll teleportation. Have to, no teleportation i mean like sure i get it like i don't want to walk because i would like to just like poof be like at the grocery store poof be at the liquor store like that would be yeah. great that's but see i would just waste it you <laughs> the know liquor store. Like, like it was just it wouldn't be it wouldn't be good i feel like telekinesis i really need telekinesis for it's like I don't really want to talk to this person how can i get out of this conversation and then i can just be like you have to do you have to do this you Wait, know? so hold on, hold on. Just the way the you get out of a conversation with telekinesis would be to fly away, move them away. You could just teleport away from it. Do you mean yeah. telepathy? No, no, I want telekinesis. Like, I want to be able to, like, get to, out of my, like, like I, you are done with this conversation kind of thing, right? I want to be able to be like, I want to be able to, like, set fires and move things with my mind. And then the person, <laughs> or like, something happens with them to where they're just like, oh no, I'm on fire. And then I'm like, oh, well, you, you look busy, so I got to go. Uh, wait, you know so what I mean? just, just to clarify, you yeah. want powers of murder and chaos just to end conversations? Derek, you make All it right. sound so simple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, when you put it like that, you make it sound like it's a horrible thing. But I mean, like, I'm desperate to end conversations a lot of the time. Again, so. I'm just going to point out, you could just teleport away. All right, I'll think about it. On the 21st, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not by ending my conversation. End the conversations. <laughs> That's fair. Well, 
I Abby, mean, what any... superpowers are you going to get on the 21st? Oh, yeah. What kind of... Um, so, uh, I believe I've already gotten some of those superpowers. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you want to know about them because they're really, like, personal. <laughs> I mean, I would have just gone with you, the power of a director now, so you get to tell people what to do. And they um, have to I got, I, you know, I have the yeah. power of black girl magic. Um, and you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, uh, bringing that out into the new year and the year after that. You're going to punish wrongdoers in the name of the moon. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, you get a transformation <laughs> sequence and everything. <laughs> in the name of the moon. <laughs> oh, oh man. God. That was but very exciting 21st look forward to it everyone's just buildings are going to be like going flying everywhere it's going to be great no <laughs> on another <laughs> note Derek I hear that you're having a ghoulish time this year sure so first I do want to say that when you said that this is the last week before X and I was like oh there's new there's more Xbox news I didn't hear about <laughs> uh, no. I, did Xmas and I was like oh that's fine uh, <laughs> but the other thing I'm actually excited about is uh, Vampire: The Eternal Struggle is back in print, uh, and like so. If you don't know, this is like the the collectible card game version of Vampire, uh, and it was like one of my big games, you know, back in the day. And there's a new like set out that has pre-constructed decks for like the five basic clans and whatnot. And I'm I'm just excited because for one. The dream of the 90s is always alive in my heart. And two, this is very much like an addition that seems to be a labor of love because it's pretty well put together. But it has the kind of thing that I love to see in a board game that most don't, um, which is there's a there's like a customized um, strategy guide for each of the decks that's actually pretty detailed and tailored to that deck. So it's like, you know, your first couple turns, do these things. Once you've achieved this state, change your plan to this. When someone attacks you with this, respond with this. So I think they do a really good job of, you know, handing you a pre-constructed deck and then giving you the information you need to actually pilot it well, um, which is a step that I think a lot of people, a lot of publishers don't necessarily have the time to do. So I'm really excited. If you haven't played it before, if you didn't know about it, if you're one of those folks who really likes multiplayer card games um this game really shines at like four to five players where you can start building alliances and stuff like that it's really really good um it's you know probably one of my favorite multiplayer card games very very cool i'm glad you could share with us and yeah no that's that's very exciting all the well, another matter about your multiplayer game. My multiplayer game's better, though, Derek. This one, Dune Imperium. Zoworm. Oh Zoworm is so big. The spice. The spice. The No, but yes, I I got in trouble the first night we got this. I basically my uh, partner and I uh stayed up and uh we played this till like <laughs> 2 a.m in the morning and i was tired oh, the next nice. day because i <laughs> so it's a good game i approve of it uh, and the ai is a pain it? in the butt huh you have it you did actually have a chance to sit down and play it too yeah awesome. i got to play it yeah really? I, got it. I, I have the special edition so all my special edition extras don't come now but they wanted to give like their whole statement was like we wanted people to play the game but yep. those who have the special edition you're gonna get your stuff later on so i got the i still stuff. want a video of you unboxing i know that you're you told me no but i i still want to see what's inside of this I'd still... oh yeah but later i could i could show you i i did it on stream uh but did it's you? all nice yeah I well, did a little bit are you on serious stream. i thought you said no i thought you were like no you buy it yourself and then i was no like, no okay. no let's see yeah it doesn't sound like a bonsai i know bonsai, oh, I bonsai whispered it she told it to me with her with her brain waves brain away yes, look at all look and at the artwork though for this look at that yeah i just it's ordered all... it <laughs> i just and, uh, went, I went and picked it up at a local store and i was like where's the upgrade pack uh, and i had to go confirm the upgrade pack's not coming until like march or something like that and they got oh, okay. all of the various different characters in here i think it's like very much uh 
Like, I'm have, just going uh, to show you. Look at all of them. Oh, they're so <gasps> good. What? Look at it. Hold on. Which one do you want to see? And then uh, I got, oh, of course, this beautiful place. Everybody loves the bear. <laughs> oh, God. That I was guy. looking for um, the guy, the emperor. Uh, I don't know if they have it. They haven't announced his character for here. I know this one would be. You guys can look at that one. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, I like that one. Oh, but yeah, no. So, so, so it's all good. It just doesn't have any of the special edition stuff right now. Okay. Uh, but it, it's a fun. It's a fun game uh, to play. To I'm just actually kidding. have a chance to actually play that with people. Yeah, well, they have a two-player option where they have an AI that is a pain in the butt because I would have won the game if the gosh darn AI didn't randomly take where I was supposed to go and I needed the spice and it stole the spice. I, never mind, I'm sorry. So I'm the AI here. is pretty good is what I'm, what I'm hearing. <laughs> AI is a pain in the butt because all it does is, is make make trouble. Make trouble. So that's, that's, that's basically, I'm mad at the AI because I could have won. You know, what's the gosh darn Also, AI. whose house are you in right now, Bonse? <laughs> I'm in my is... old Victorian English. Oh, I realized that I am in the wrong house. <laughs> no one told me. Oh, I just assumed that this was a uh, uh, Queen's it's, Gambit it's reference. A, it's a holiday <laughs> house. I thought you were being I... real subtle. <laughs> I thought, she I, was vis- I thought she was visiting the queen. I really did. Per the I mean, yes, this is my right. holiday I did house. ask this as soon as I got on. I did say, oh, this is a really nice house. Whose house is this? And y'all, y'all ignored I didn't, me. I didn't, I didn't understand. <laughs> I didn't hear you say that. <laughs> but it's All okay. Right. No, this is I'm my Christmas so holiday house. Do you not like I love my that. Home? My Christmas I, holiday I house? I love yes. that for you. <laughs> so it's your winter home. Got it. My winter home. Yeah, I totally, uh, totally did not forget to change my background. <laughs> I thought you just broke into somebody else's house to do table takes, and I was, I was happy for only, you. Only proper way: eat the rich, break into their house for the holidays. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Oh no, don't break into people's house for the holidays. But uh, on 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 like fun news that we could look forward to next year, uh, Derek, you got some information for us, correct? And we look of. forward to it next year, Derek. Uh, keep your fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay. So uh, Gen Con has released a statement about uh, 2021, and it kind of boils down to um, we are hopeful, be patient, but we are being cautious. Uh, so we very much want to host a in-person convention in the summer of 2021. But to make sure that we can make a responsible and safe decision, we have postponed badge reg and event reg which would normally be starting up right at the beginning of january we've postponed that till later in the year we should have more information to announce uh and probably as early as we can next year basically um there's not a definite timeline but like you know if you're paying attention to the news it's pretty clear how quickly things are changing um a lot of people have a lot of hope right now i have both fingers you know all my fingers and all my hands crossed uh we will see how it works out because i would very much like to have an in-person convention again see all my friends uh and kind of get back to normal as best we can um but until we actually have the information to make that kind of assessment we kind of have to cool our heels a little bit and wait until we have more info so keep an eye on our social media keep an eye on our website we do have the full statement that we've released um Uh, on our site if people want to read that if you have any questions you can certainly reach out to gen con and ask Uh, we'd be happy to answer them Um, but until then we're keeping an eye on stuff you should keep an eye on stuff and uh, stay safe wear a mask and hopefully get ready for a vaccine soon yes very very helpful um and Mm-hmm. Oh, and also on other good, awesome news that we're hearing about, uh, I know Emma's probably going to be heartbroken that she couldn't uh, tell the news to y'all, but uh, Amari uh, Akil has become uh, the new president of IGDN, sorry, IGDN, which is the Indie Game Developer Network. Uh, so uh, he, um, Omari, is uh, one half of the brother, uh, the board game brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, they, like, he just has announced that uh, he's become the new president of this uh, 
uh, IDG or IGDN. Um, their mission statement, if you guys want to go ahead and hear it uh, briefly, is uh, the Indie Game Developer Network uh, is an international volunteer trade organization that supports indie games developers, uh, indie game developers creating, publishing, and promoting fantastic games. Uh, the uh, IGDN brings together a wide variety of developers, including pen and paper, card games, LARP, uh, board game designers in a private environment where each uh, and every member uh, strives for excellence. We encourage and seek diverse voices to join us and uh, particularly among traditional underrepresented segments of the larger gaming community, all gaming creators and professionals, including women, uh, people of color, LGBTQ and A, or Q, I, and A uh, individuals, and those with disabilities are encouraged to apply. So, hey, this is a good step, you know, for a lot of these companies, especially uh, us as gamers. And now we're seeing, um, you know, changes like IGDN has always been like kind of like a newer forefront company that has been very accepting and and such of these crowds. Um, but no, it's just it's really cool to hear about these things mm -hmm. and well, Am you know, amari's been doing such great work recently uh both in his own game design but you know like further activism and whatnot so uh it's great to see his kind of continued involvement and rising to more prominence uh the igdn has had an event space at gen con the past several years where they've you know had mostly focused on rpgs but not exclusively and, you know, they've been a great partner. They've been running, you know, many really high demand events, giving folks kind of a, a place and a chance to expose their game to folks at Gen Con. So it'll be really interesting to see what Omari wants to do with the organization moving forward. Mm -hmm. I have to correct you, though, Bonsai. It is not the oh. board game Brothers. It is the board game Brothers. Brothers. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> I got to say, say it with the, the emphasis. I forgot to. Brothers. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> oh man, but yes. So it's exciting to see what's going to happen and and all that kind of stuff. Now, of course, moving on. Uh, Abby has some words. Strange things are happening for the holidays. <laughs> yes. Um, so the cast of Stranger Things is actually creating some individual content. They are doing a recorded session today uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it's actually played by some of your favorite cast members, David Harbour, which is Jim Hopper, Finn Wolfhard, which is Mike Wheeler, Gatton Matazaro, which is Dustin Henderson, and Natalia Dyer, AKA Nancy Wheeler. Um, they all are shooting a, well, actually they all shot a, a socially distanced Christmas themed D&D &D game called, called Lost Odyssey Toy Time for 10 Towns, which is Saving Christmas in the same region, rhyme of the Frost Maiden is set in. Uh, the game itself was led with no other by my boyfriend, who's currently locked in my basement, uh, Chris Perkins, um, who is the uh, principal story designer for Dungeons and Dragons at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so if you want to get a chance to watch it, it's on YouTube today. Uh, it started at 10, uh, 10 p.m., so it's available to watch now. It's interesting they put it up on YouTube because I, I heard the announcement and I kind of assumed it would just be on Netflix. Like Netflix? I don't know if Netflix oh. has done anything that's um, YouTube-esque yeah. or like content-esque. Yeah. You know, not content-esque, but at least like a, a podcast, yeah, like live video cast stuff, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think that they've done anything like that. So I think to, to stay If anything, I would have thought it would have been on Twitch. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it makes sense to have it on Twitch, but I mean, well, but you know, you, YouTube is the outside, classic. <laughs> that's probably why they, they put it up on YouTube. But like, I yeah. do wonder if this is them uh, seeing how folks will respond to mm -hmm. like celebrity stuffed actual plays. Yeah. Um, you know, so like, you know, that obviously made me think of what other shows do we want to see the cast of sit down to play one or another different kind of RPG? Mm. The uh, cast of Star Trek Discovery. I want them ooh. to play the Star Trek Discovery game. I want the cast of Dune to play the Dune game. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I do. Want... I really do. And I think they should do it. I think that would be brilliant, brilliant marketing. But that's would, you just have them, would you have them play their own characters, though? 
No, I think no. it would be much more fun if they had played other characters. I I definitely want them to do this. I don't know who <laughs> I have to speak to about this, but I've been thinking about it ad nauseum for months. So yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, a new uh, old show that just started their first episode last week um, for season five, The Expanse, I would love for all of the villains involved in the show to play a D&D game. Ooh. I think that would be really interesting just to see. I, I, I would definitely be up for that. Yeah. I mean, my first thought obviously was some of the cast of True Blood sitting down to play vampire. Uh, okay. That would be really fun. <laughs> Okay. They're rebooting that too. Did you hear that, Derek? Uh, I heard that. Uh, are they rebooting it without Suki and Bill? Because that'd be great. <laughs> oh uh, no! Don't say that. Wait, they're, aren't they're, they the main I'm characters? Sure I'm sure they are. Yeah, yeah they're the main they characters. are. They are the main characters. <laughs> I was like, I almost was like thinking about that. I was like, oh maybe. And then I was like, wait, aren't they yeah. like yeah. the Edward and Bella of this whole franchise? <laughs> yeah, well, they hundred percent are, and that also makes them like, like after after first season, like one season, sure, I get it. You know, your relationships as up and downs, but then like they're set, like all the rest yeah. of the seasons being like, here's a new hot guy. How are we going to use him to drive a wedge between the two of them was like, no, how about we just explore the other characters? Is that really what it's like? Is it just a new hot guy every week? Because I didn't no, hear every that. Every season, every season. Oh, oh really? I was, I'm I'm not wait, 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 am I the only one who watched <laughs> True Blood? Yeah, I wasn't yep. very interested okay, in that. True, well, I'm sorry, if you want hot guys who don't wear shirts, True Blood is where it is at. Yeah, I, it I mean, seemed like it was very like for horny housewives. You know what I mean? It seemed like it was like, are that. you are you a housewife who is not hardcore enough to read Anne Rice? Then this is kind <laughs> of like it's like it's like the Hunger Games is to Battle Royale as oh. that show is to Interview with a Vampire of the Anne Rice universe. That's how I took it. It's, it's and all I ever knew I was I, I think was you might be friend. giving Anne Rice a little too much credit there as much as I love Anne Rice. Uh, sure. But, uh, sure. Like, do you know how horny her Anne Rice's writing oh, is with yes, vampires? I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> True Blood is just as just right up there too. So I can't. I can't. I, I Wait, feeling, this feeling, sounds like this um, is another PowerPoint presentation. I have a feeling that you have it. a lot to discover in True Blood. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Without getting off of the topic of True Blood really quickly, you do have to realize that one of the characters involved in True Blood is an avid D D player. I do not know yeah, how to say Joe his last Maganella. name. Yes, Joe Maganella. There we go. Joe, 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 Joe. That's right. He, he is was uh, phenomenal. He, and he was at Gen Con right? last year. Ooh. Wasn't he at Gen Con last year? Uh, I think so. I'm not sure. I, know, he I wasn't, heard he, he was. Yeah, he, you know, we would, we wouldn't be surprised. Okay. But yeah, I think he, had, I think he was El Cid, so I think he spent almost an entire season being a werewolf with his shirt off. So Yes, he did. Yeah. I know. I've seen the pictures. I, I, I see that you just like the pictures. Yeah. Uh, but no. <laughs> I mean... All I remember about that is like that and the way that my friend would always be like, the main guy, he has this. He's British, but he has this weird accent. He's like he's weird supposed Louisiana to be. Accent. He's supposed to be and southern. So he's always from like shook it, shook it, shook it. <laughs> That's all I remember is my friend be like shook it, shook it. And like I never understood what that was referencing. See how much better it would be laugh. without Sookie and Bill. <laughs> So, right. I mean, right. yeah, well, we can have yeah. like as vast speculations as possible, but yeah. I think you'll be excited of other than, of course, like people, actors playing games. We got actors actually getting cast in uh, the D&D film. So Chris Pine has been uh, is is um, maybe is a rumor to be in the fr like basically starring in the new Dungeons and Dragons movie. They are, quote unquote, in negotiations and yes. quote unquote coming to the big screen courtesy of appropriately enough game night director john francis daly and jonathan goldstein quote unquote so uh we have of course arguments uh for and pro and uh nay against prince prime so let's go ahead and isabella tell us about what your feelings are uh, against chris prime. I, yet again i, I have, have to feelings. assess <laughs> <laughs> I love how it's like Isabella how do you feel about this and Abby's like 
let's <laughs> okay <laughs> so have- i i have to i have to reassert i do not i am not there is no binary i'm not i don't know <laughs> you keep setting this up as though abby and i are on opposite sides of this we're end. fighting on this one no we're not i <laughs> i refuse i'm a pacifist i do not believe <laughs> which is why i want telekinesis so that i can avoid all conflict no, um, so- it, hold on hold on hold on <laughs> isabella Lighting someone on fire to get out of a conversation <laughs> not, a not being a pacifist. I don't have to directly do anything. I just think it with my mind and then I That's leave. still doing I... something. No, it's it's very <laughs> passive. It's a very passive. Only ability. in a court of law. <laughs> There's no crime. There's no federal law against <sighs> killing a man with your mind. And I know that I have looked. Yeah, sure. So okay. there's no rule against you playing basketball with telekinesis either. That doesn't make, you know, air bud, mind bud a good movie. My face hurts How dare so you. much. How dare so, you? It's like yes. air bud. <laughs> all right. All right. So here's the thing. Um, there's a, there's a law in California which states that if you're going to make a major franchise movie, it has to star a man named Chris. Um, and so far, uh, we've used up all of our Chris's and the next Chris on the ducket is Chris Pine. Personally, I saw him in A Wrinkle in Time um, and he has the clearest blue eyes I've ever seen in my entire life. Magnetic, uh. hypnotic, and I think they're gorgeous. Any person that, uh, any white man that works for Oprah and gets Oprah's sign of approval is good enough for me. Um, so out of all the Chris's they could have picked, I'm okay with this Chris. I'm kind of chock full on Hemsworth. I could, I could care less for Pratt. He is the weakest Chris. Um, and was it, wasn't Chris Pine also the one who was in the, the erotic fiction writing class and all of his, his classmates said that he was very good and very respectful and was a great person. Cause I just assumed that that was very on brand for you, and that was why you supported him. Wait, only Derek and Marcus know about this. <laughs> Can't, I cannot. No, apparently, it's, only... <laughs> apparently it's true. Yeah, like, why are you two so okay? Never mind. Um, so, um, I, I, my guess about this, what I'm really concerned with is honestly that it's John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein who are going to be in charge of this D and D. Um, a movie I've seen their other films they're not very good um, a game night was an okay I could say that that's my opinion I don't think that they're very competent filmmakers I think that they thank are you. thank you you know and so I, I don't have much hope in them taking that on I also don't know that John Francis Daly I know that he proclaims to be a nerd a lot of the time but of the nerd content that I've seen him do it's it's very underwhelming it's very much like fake gamer boy kind of energy that I get from him. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Shots fired. Um, so I I don't know, but I will say that there's been so much of a ground laid for D&D kind of a movie. I mean, we've had Game of Thrones, so that sort of ground as far as a fantasy, a widespread fantasy series. We've had the Witcher series, which is also a widespread fantasy series. Uh, Stranger Things, there is there is a guide work for them to follow. Sure. Um, and but, I but think to, that is to, to counter that, like you know, yes, I think there's a lot of groundwork laid for a, a big blockbuster fantasy movie. Sure. But do you think there's groundwork laid for a D movie? Because I don't think the two exactly. are quite the same. Yeah, I do think that there's there's groundwork for for fan. I mean, there's we have so many fantasy films. I mean, even if they were just to be like, listen, you guys. We've watched Lord of the Rings 80 times and we're just going to do this. I'd be like, yeah, that's pretty good, actually. That's a pretty good syllabus to go from. So sure. I, I think there is groundwork. And even if they made a D&D knockoff of the Lord of R- the Rings movies, I would watch that. I'm, I'm OK with that. Um, and the idea of having Chris Pine as, as the star of this, I will say the cast will probably be pretty expansive. Mm-hmm. And I don't really care that they're having a white guy as the kind of the lead. What really matters to me is the kind of, the kind of expansiveness. What would, what would really set me off, and I will say this, is that if all of the orcs and all of the kind of like drow and all of the, those characters are played by people of color. That would be the thing where I'd be like, absolutely not cancel this. It's over with. And then if all the elves were played by like white people, then that would be like, all right, the movie's done. It's over with. But just 
Chris Pine. Chris Pine is one of the good ones. He's he's all right with me. But they do need to. I I I'm reserving my my judgment for the rest of the casting. We'll see. I, I'm I am literally okay if Chris Pine is playing the villain. <laughs> you know, I think that they, um, especially, you know, where we're at now in this day and age, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I don't have too much confidence in these directors right now. Um, but if they wanted to to cast someone with the name Chris, they could have gone ludicrous or something. You know, I'm sorry, but like, that is my I'm, favorite loophole. That is I, my favorite <laughs> made up loophole for a made up law. I am so sorry. I did not see that one coming. That really hit me at the side of the face. <laughs> Ludacris. Hun. Ludacris is the the most uh, like and, and first of all, Ludacris Chris has some acting chops. He very much has acting chops. If you've seen him in Fast and the Furious, Hun. he is absolutely Don't do this to me. amazing. Yeah, Don't do I'm this doing to it. Me. I am doing it. I'm doing. I'm doing it so hard. I am doing it hard. If they if they got Ludacris, if they got um, oh let's see, um, Idris. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Idris. Elba. Idris is is a is a um, word that rhymes with Chris. Yes, that is. Well, I mean, you know, we we didn't go off of any other Chris's. We can just go with the one Chris and, and stay with Ludacris. <laughs> but um, they could have done so much better in this world, especially because there've been so much um, talk and disagreements in the fact that shows like Lord of the Rings uh is is very racist you know especially with how they cast people like i literally had a conversation with someone who i do not talk to anymore um that was like oh yeah they had black people in lord of the rings i was like are you freaking kidding me right now and she, you know it was just like the 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 caucasity that is going yeah. on in, in I mean, the hiring there, of this there is there's, there's so- a lot to be said about like sort of the, the co- color coding, racial coding that happens in D&D and happens in a lot of yes. fantasy. Um, and I don't necessarily think that a lot of that was sort of baked into Lord of the Rings, but through a sort of long um, translation to the modern lens, D- Dun- Lord of the Rings has sort of been uh, very, um, it's very, how do I explain this? Like, a, it's a very encapsulation of, of whiteness and white yeah. identity. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in a way that I don't think was the original intention that has sort of happened over time. Yeah. Um, and so I think that this is an opportunity. I've heard for the Lord of the Rings tangent for the for the Amazon television show that they are going uh, with a fairly it diverse is, casting. So um, I'm actually so. on the team to talk about that. Um, and we've been talking about it at San Diego Comic-Con with the One, one Ring. Um, and I've actually gotten a chance to talk with some of the actors that are involved, um, a lot of them being from the UK. Um, but Amazon is doing what needs to be done in television and film, um, mainly Hollywood, when it comes to representation in their media. Um, if you see the cast of the new um, Amazon television show, Lord of the Rings, it is a beautiful rainbow. Like it's like if Josephine Has Baker adopted all of all of these people. Beca- so. Yeah, if you if you um, if you see my panel from San Diego Comic Con, I can send you the link if you want me to. Um, oh, we sure. can. <laughs> I can tell that's, you that that's like, been announced already. The casting of it. Yeah, yeah. All um, mm-hmm. majority of the casting. They've already started filming. They have yeah. already been filming for like the past six months now. They stopped for two <laughs> months, obviously, because New Zealand was shut down. Um, but New Zealand opened back up again in August for filming. Uh, so yeah, they they've already you know started it. And like I said, it's a beautiful. Oh, we just don't know who of, everybody is playing. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you yeah, don't I'm know who they're playing, the but because I I knew I knew that they had started filming a while ago, but um, I. I knew that amongst the nerd sphere, yeah. who they casted in what role would be big news, <laughs> because yeah. that's that's when that happens. I'm very I'm terrified. That's, yeah, really, well, yeah. in the so, in the yeah. in the conversation oh. for San Diego, we actually talk about the cast and who the possibility of them being cast are, since they're playing in the world of the Samarillion. So, like I said, I can send you the San Diego link and you can check it out. 
this sounds like like ooh that new news like when we get back uh from like the table takes for the new years we could talk about yes. all this stuff because it sounds like the more like I don't know like I don't want to get you in trouble and you're like look at all these news and we're like ooh and we're like, <laughs> uh but Yes. No, I mean, this is just more to look at. And I'm sure like <laughs> later on next year, if you guys want more on this discussion of Lord of Definitely. the Rings, racial stereotypes, that could be something in discussion. You could put us in discord and be like, also on YouTube, just comment down below, be like, Hey, we want to actually hear this discussion uh, more in depth because you know, it is quite an exciting thing to talk about. <laughs> but more uh, on the fact as we uh, move along. So Derek, you are very excited, uh, of course, by the ghouls and vampires of charity. Uh, yes, my my <laughs> excitement uh, knows no bounds. Uh, I am filled with uh, fantastic glee, as I'm sure you can see, uh, because yesterday, uh, uh, the World of Darkness released the V5 Companion as a PDF. So this is a free thing you can download from worldofdarkness.com. You just need to go and register an account. And it includes the rules for Ravnos, uh, Zimis or Shimisi, Salubri, um, a whole bunch of stuff that people have been really waiting for or wondering to, um, when will come to the new edition. Uh, it's really interesting stuff. I think they did a really uh, slick job on a lot of it. It also includes some rules for ghouls, playing mortals and some really interesting stuff to play with um, to um, play around with coteries and, and different clans working together. So if you're a fan of the new edition of vampire, the RPG, you definitely want to go register for an account and grab it. Uh, apparently they had like 10,000 downloads in the first 12 hours or so. So uh, a lot of people apparently are thirsty for vampire. The other piece of vampire news is that this weekend is just going to be full of World of Darkness streams. Uh, like pretty much all day, Saturday and Sunday, there is going to be a streaming marathon to fundraise for a Tiltify campaign for Direct Relief, which is a charity that we have seen Bundle of Holding pick up a bunch of times. Um, but Saturday, 11 a.m. to 4 a.m. Eastern Time, and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, they have streams from all different groups, all different uh, people who are running streams or developing World of Darkness games or video games or tabletop or whatever else. So if you're running around this weekend, you might want to put your, their, the World of Darkness Twitch stream on in the background to catch stuff as it's being announced. All right. Very, very cool. Well, those were our headlines of today, folks. But hey... Hold your horses right now, because we are going to go ahead and gallop straight into bundles with Derek the Bundle Boss. Beep, beep, beep. Shh, 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 shh. So we have three bundles this week. Uh, the first one from Bundle of Holding, our old friends there, is topical, as we just kind of briefly mentioned previously, The Expanse. Um, it's both The Expanse and their modern age uh, kind of thing where they adapted to, uh, it's like a d20 modern kind of situation you know or urban fantasy stuff like that uh that so for the the 20 collection you get the modern age core book you get the companion to it you get a, a dimension hopping setting a book of enemies and allies uh adventure and a gm kit uh for 31 dollars, you get the expanse collection which includes all of that plus the stuff that's come out for the expanse so the core book for that gm kit for that and then two adventures for that so you could buy that and then hope that the cast from the Expanse shows up at your house and sits down and wants to play the Expanse RPG with you, and you will be prepped and ready to go, just in case that you know is a Christmas miracle that happens to you. you uh, we have an uh, an itch.io bundle, or more accurately, kind of a collection of several bundles that are very interesting, because they specifically the instructions are not to buy this bundle for yourself. They want you to buy the bundle and give it to somebody. They want you to give for the season. And there's one big bundle that's $120 and has 69 different uh, indie RPGs in it. But there are also a ton, or there's six different uh, $30 bundles that are much more kind of reasonable as a gift price. So all the games are kind of split up among those groups. It's all uh, under the name of Epimus. So, you know, we have a link to the main one. It links to the smaller ones. 
Uh, I think this is just a really, really good bundle to buy for the GM in your life who's always running games or for that person you know that's always interested in indie games because this is a really neat slice of some of the prominent indie games on itch right now. You know, it includes Feather Beacon Bone, A Rasp of Sand, The Bloody Handed Name of Bronze, Six Goblins, Draculola. Lots of really interesting stuff in there for folks to kind of grab and share around with people. Uh, and that has six days left, by the way. And then finally, in kind of a somber note, there's a memorial bundle uh, of cult material. And this is for Ryan Northcott, or also known as Mechano Receptor, who was a very prominent uh, person in the cult community. Uh, he created a lot of work. He worked on the new edition of the game. He composed music for the game and stuff like that. And he passed away in June. So the community and the company have kind of come together to make this bundle of community content, like adventures, inspiration, dark secrets and stuff like that. The kind of things that, you know, he would have kind of helped share or create, put them together in a huge bundle to uh, promote the fundraiser for his family, for his wife and his daughters uh, to raise some money to kind of deal with the situation. And those are our bundles for this week. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so guys, look ahead. Um, they're still like a week before Christmas, maybe, uh, or holidays, or it's right now, what, the seventh day of Hanukkah. So, hey, there you go. Chris, holiday season uh, gift ideas for your role-playing uh, nerd in your life. Also, now it is time for Kickstarter Queen, Derek. Why, hello. Yeah. Uh, this week, Abby, you have something you're excited about you want to share with us? I do. Yeah. Um, so I just got a chance to back it because I love dice. Um, <laughs> so um, there's a new, well, not new Kickstarter, but uh, there's a Kickstarter that's uh, only got about four days left mm -hmm. on it called uh, Uncharted and it, they have three different designs of die on there with a total of 12 different sets. Now the cool and amazing thing that they just did is that if you fund this Kickstarter, if you contribute to it, um, if you pick a set of dice, uh, you can actually pick any set depending on the level that you you choose you can actually pick any set even from the unlocked dice now uh they only have four days left so if you can contribute go ahead because these dice are beautiful um they literally are like they're they're um described as extremely extravagant. Um, each dice is wrapped twice by additional metal edges, the surfaces of which are all made of 24 karat gold. So um, the whole premises of was combining steampunk with um, Aurora and the beautiful brilliance of human nature, human nature shining in destruction. So the fact that they had 24 karat gold, like outlining the, the sides of the dice was just a, a seller to me. Uh, and they have, like I said, they have 12 different sets and you can choose from any of them if you back this project. So go out and do it as soon as possible. You have four days left. Great. Also with four days left, we have another Kickstarter from Heresy Lab, which is a miniature design studio I brought up before. Every now and then they'll come out with a big, huge Kickstarter that like almost kind of covers all of your needs for an army. And this one is the greater good. So it's pretty much all the troops that you would need for a Tau army with a slightly different style. So uh, they even have like crude models and stuff like that. So if you're a, a 40K fan, if you really love the Tau and you want to get some different sculpts to really give your army some unique character, uh, I've, I have backed a number of their projects before and I've been really impressed with the quality of the miniatures I've gotten. So uh, this is going to be right up your alley. And that has four days left as well. And then the next project that we want to talk about is the Alhambra Big Box 2nd Edition. And this is from Queen Games. It has four days left as well. They've done a number of these projects where they make a, a big box. Um, and uh, it basically just means it's a new, larger box that will fit, often sometimes will come with all of the expansions that have come out for a game. So Alhambra did have a big box before, but now this one will fit the new expansions that have come out since then. Some of the components are improved, like the play tiles. Uh, there's this new um, 
like a little cardboard tower you get to build to dispense the tiles out of and stuff like that. So Alhambra was uh, a Spiliara's winner in 2003. It's one of those classic games. If you want to pick up a classic or if you have it and you love it and you want a better way to store it and all the expansions you bought for it, you have four days to back it. Isabel, how about you? Yeah. So with four days left as well, I have Tomb Punk, which is a lo-fi role-playing game. Uh, I was really captured by the art of it. It re really reminds me uh, a lot of uh, the kind of art from like the Hellboy comic books and things like that. Um, Tomb Punk also really excited me. I love the idea of doing something where it's like you put punk on the end of anything and I'll buy it. Um, and this is a rules light um fast based um uh, basically dungeon crawling game but instead of dungeons you're not crawling through dungeons you're crawling through tombs uh the aesthetics of it really remind me of the conan movie or uh, if you're a fan uh, of the mummy movies uh from the early 2000s as well um the game looks really cool and uh one of the things that's uh really um awesome about it is uh, that it's very fast based and so you can they have micro settings inside of it so you can just jump right in start playing um, and get through um, quick sessions that has four days left Toon punk a lo-fi role-playing game all right well the next project that i wanted to talk about has five days left and this is polyhedral and it's a collection, uh, like a, a book or uh, a collection of interviews with various different tabletop developers, designers, authors, uh, stuff like that. It includes interviews with, you know, my friend Teo Sabadia, who worked on D&D Organized Play and Dwarven Forge. It includes Banana Chan, who's been involved in a number of other projects we've been really excited about lately. Um, you know, uh, Game and a Curry is her company. Uh, Jung Shi, uh, or, um, Blood in the Banquet Hall was one of the big prominent games they released recently. Keith Baker of Gloom and Eberron is going to be in there. They're talking to Beetle and Grimm, the designers of Mortborg, Shauna Germain from Money Cook, James Jercasso of Burn Bright, D D, MCDM, Daniel Kwan of Asians Represent. Matt Mercer from Critical Role, Elisa Teague, who is the senior uh, producer at Renegade, designed Betrayal at House on the Hills expansion Whittle Walk, uh, worked on D&D, Chris Spivey from Harlem Unbound. Like, there's a bunch of other people, too. Like, those were just the names that leapt out at me. So this looks like it's going to be a really good collection of interviews from a slice across the industry. So anybody who wants a little bit of a insight as to designer perspective, designer experiences, you're definitely going to want to check out this collection of interviews, I think. So that has five days left, polyhedral. And then the other project I wanted to discuss was The Boys that has six days left. Uh, this is uh, a board game adaptation. Uh, it's called This Is Going to Hurt. And it's a competitive game. You're playing the characters from a comic book, but you're all traveling the world, building your own team of superheroes to go beat up more people uh, and kind of get justice uh, such as it exists in The Boys. Uh, this very much strikes me as one of those, if you are the person who loves the boys, whether the comic or the TV show uh, or whatever, um, chances are this is going to be one of those games that's going to tap into a lot of the details that you love. So you might want to check it out. You got six days left. There's a $60 version that's just like cardboard standees. And there's a super deluxe version for 180 that has like miniatures and a bust and uh, signed copies of the, the graphic novels and stuff like that. So check it out. And uh, moving on with 13 days left, I have Tall Tales, uh, which uh, at first was really captured by the beautiful art of this, um, but also this is a competitive story writing game. So it has a physical uh, game element to it, but you are writing a story and uh, it's kind of, it's competitive. Uh, where you all get different kind of pieces of a story and you get to combine the story 
And this is just a really great way of connecting to other people, communicating with other people, using your imagination, using your storytelling skills that we normally employ when we're doing tabletop games, but in a different sort of a way where we're crafting stories. And I thought this was a really lovely um, game because of the fact that it is really much more about using your imagination and crafting new kind of legends and stories with your friends and not necessarily about like, how much can you sort of obey the rules that was set by the dungeon master and things like that. So I'm really excited. This is a very cute game um, and just a really kind of like a game that you can play to get to know people better and connect with other people um, and uh, it has gorgeous, gorgeous art. So that's Tale, Tall Tales with 13 Days Left. I also have to say that if you donate to the Kickstarter, you get an immediate download of the game uh, and then the physical game will be released this summer as well. So you can start playing it as soon as you put some money down, which is really cool. All right, uh, our last, last Kickstarter day uh, is with 13 Days Left, Winter Queen. Uh, it's a beautiful abstract strategy game uh, design, uh, from the designers of Space Explorer and Vice, Viceroy. Um, it's basically lots of winter with lots of colors. Um, it's based around drafting color gems and creating different scoring patterns with them. Uh, this game is very similar if you were into um, uh, games like Azul or Sagrada, uh, basically like tile placement and elimination and trying to like get the best beautiful patterns. Uh, this is the game for you. Uh, the, the rules are simple, but it leaves a lot of like, um, leaves... Uh, a lot of room for depth. Uh, it's just drafting colorful pieces um, instead of like tiles that you would usually get for other games. They are just like resin gems, like beautiful resin gems uh, you can look at. So if you like those kind of pattern collecting type of games, uh, this would be the game for you. Winter King Queen with 13 days left, Thursday, December 31st. Well, folks, like I said, that was our Kickstarters. But hey, wait, 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 wait. No running away. Just stick around because we are going to be diving in to The Well by uh, Peter Schaefer. Um, so if you guys just wait a few minutes, we're going to go ahead and get our the, the creator in. And we will have something exciting to tell you about this new RPG. So stick around, folks. Everybody, and thank you for sticking around during a brief break well we brought in an old friend of mine peter schaefer who is here to talk about a new project that he has on kickstarter peter do you want to introduce yourself and kind of talk about what you're doing sure uh, my name is peter schaefer uh, i worked for uh, wizards of the coast for a couple of years and did a lot of freelancing for white wolf and then onyx path um and i'm very very happy to finally finally be uh trying to self-publish my own game of many years creation uh the well uh, which is on kickstarter now and it's uh you just it's a society of people who all live underground and have as long as they can remember and uh when they run out of resources or when they've filled their tunnels with they're tombed dead, they're entombed dead, they move farther down, and eventually the levels above them uh, become dangerous because the, the dead reanimate. And uh, you play people who go up the well to explore and, and kill the undead and find uh, lost treasures. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else in the stream here can see the picture that should be replacing me right now in the stream. Can you see it? <laughs> no. Uh, oh, okay. Well, well, I could, I could see it on my yeah, end. I yeah. see it's very, uh, very good teeth you have on there. Very well, animated. <laughs> very animated. Okay. Well, if 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 everything's going as I intended, it should be a, a photo of a of a skull with a with a pipe. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah. I, I happen to have that skull by my by my computer right now. So, oh. so it comforts you is what you're saying. I, I yes, it looks you, over you, me as you I you have write. gone up the well and you have conquered your ancestors and brought them back so that their strength is yours now. This one in particular, I mean, in some ways, this is my grandmother's skull. In um, some way. Uh my grandfather was a 
a doctor in a teaching hospital. And so he had access to, you know, human remains for teaching purposes. And he gave this skull to my grandmother as a gift. So it's a real skull? It is a real skull. Wow. Cool. Uh, I think I just saw some article today about how I think the Hamlet production with David Tennant in it or something like that. Uh, Tchaikovsky, I guess, donated his skull to the theater to be used in Hamlet and they didn't use it until David Tennant did it and he started using the real skull but then they stopped using the real skull because the audience got creeped out by it uh, but then it turned out that when they said they stopped using it, it was a <laughs> lie and they were still using it, they just didn't want the audience to be creeped out by it. So there's a, there's a whole thing there. Anyway. See, now I know when I, what I want done with my skull after I die. <laughs> and you, you also figure. had me a David Tennant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Bonsai, why don't you take the, the first question about the, the roots oh, of yeah. the cell, maybe? Yeah, no, I just, I, like, I read a bit about, like, basically what the whole premise is. So what is, like, what inspired you? Because obviously it, it's kind of like a flip on the, 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 the dragon, you know, like the role-playing trope of like, up mm -hmm. is good, down is bad, but now it's down is good, up is bad. <laughs> you're, you're exactly right. So it's, I don't, I hope this is interesting. I don't, and, and not boring, but it, it came out of, um, I tend to be, when designing, I tend to be a systems first kind of designer. So I had, a dice mechanic that I wanted to play with, something that seemed very simple and pretty quick and I wanted to explore with it. And I wanted to see just, I wanted a, a bare bones basic setting that I could use to explore the dice mechanic. And I thought, well, what's more fundamental? What's more getting back to the roots than dungeons, crypts and undead? Um, and the only condition that my strange brain put on that was it had to make sense um, because you go deeper into the, the ground and it gets more dangerous and the treasure is worth more as the farther, the deeper you go. In classic D&D &D, with the Underdark, that makes sense or in a way or it can because you're going into deeper, uh, deeper into this whole underground world. But I limited myself to crypts and the undead just to keep things kind of pure and simple. And if you go farther down, I couldn't think of a logical way for the deeper crypts to be the most dangerous. If you're just mm -hmm. digging holes in the ground and burying people, and then you run out of space, maybe you can dig deeper, but then the, the newer crypts will be deepest, right? The farther down you go, they'll be the youngest and the youngest tombs should never be the most dangerous. That does, it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, and so I had to do it another way. I tried to do a tower. I thought if you had a necropolis that would entomb people and then build up a level and then do it again, um, I thought, okay, you can then go down from the top of this necrop necropolitic tower. And that could be really like, and that still appeals to me in a way, but a part of my brain said, well, if you just, you want to get to the most exciting part, you can just set a bomb or something and break in through the side of the tower from the very bottom. And that seemed too easy. I wanted you to have to go through the whole dangerous part first. Um, and that's when I inverted it and put you underground and moving always deeper away from the, the, the people you'd left behind, the crypts. The, the Kickstarter seems to suggest that the this you know last human city, or at least as far as it knows, I guess last mm -hmm. you know living city, uh, seems to be like fleeing something. Um, yeah. Like, do you, in your mind, do you have a very clear image and explanation for what that evil force that's above them that they're fleeing from is, or it, like even in your mind, is that still kind of vague and and changes game to game? I, I have my own personal answer. Um, I didn't write it into the book because uh, I, I wanted people to come up with their own answers. I wanted uh, people to shape the game to fit their own themes and mysteries. Um, and also because in my head, uh, the, the answer lay, you know, all the way at the top, if there is a top. And I just didn't have enough space to write all of those different levels. Um, uh, in the book, I detail 12 levels above, above the city of Bastion. Um, and in my head, there are at least 
40 more or something before you reach a, a surface if there is one. So I, I have answers in mind. Um, I, I, I leave a bunch of suggestions in the game. Uh, you know, you could do this, you could do that. Um, do you do you leave those like um, like do you detail those twelve levels or do you go like very OSRE where you just kind of have uh, random tables that people can roll to get details from or do you do both? Um, let's see. I I definitely enjoyed random tables in some regards um, for monster generating uh, and for treasure. Uh, I when I'm running a game, I like to be surprised as well, so I like to roll things to find out what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, I, I detail, I gave character to each of the different levels that you can go to. Um, you know, this, this one has, uh, hall hallways that are wider and easier to see around. And sometimes that it can affect the checks that you're doing, uh, or, or, uh, level, level 11 is one of my favorites because there are no monsters. It's just full of ash. Um, and, and the mystery of that is a lot of fun for me, so. Well, so you mentioned that mechanics was kind of your first inspiration for this. And I think that was the part that Abby was most excited about in the project. Mm -hmm. um, do you wanna maybe uh, talk about that and ask him questions that you had on the mechanics? Yeah, um, so I was actually wondering, um, you know, based on, on seeing some of the information on the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I love the art. Um, the, the picture of the grave digger that I saw in there, that was just, you know, absolutely, it's, it's very like old English eclectic style mm -hmm. drawings. Um, and I really love that, but, um, I was just wondering if you could summarize maybe the mechanics of the game and if there was something that specifically inspired you to go to those specific type of mechanics. Sure. So first of all, um, uh, Kurt Komoda did uh, all the interior art and uh, he just did a fantastic job with it. I, I love his work. Um, uh, if, you, if you look him up on, online, you will find a whole lot of really engaging, um, like Lovecraft inspired art as well. And that's what, that's what led me to, to, well, that's what led me to contact him. What first put me in mind of him was his work on Torchbearer. Um, but to answer your question, um, so the, the, the thing that really put me on route towards the mechanics was um, a dissatisfaction with uh, an element of fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons, um, uh, which I worked on while I was at Wizards. And uh, I, you know, I liked a lot about the game. One of the things that, that I found very frustrating was it gave you uh, abilities that you could use once per day often in the game and uh, usually they involved an attack roll or a saving throw or something along those lines uh, and you could just miss and fail and they were supposed to be a big impactful thing that you would save and save and then finally use it but it did nothing uh, half you know roughly half the time a lot of those powers had kind of you know uh, halfway effects, things that they will do if you were, uh, you know, if you missed so that they didn't seem as bad, but they still felt bad. Um, so I started searching for, when I was designing on my own, I was looking for ways to avoid missing. I was looking at what if we only, you know, play the hits. Um, and I took that and then I went back and looked at the original original D, D where everything was d20s and d6s right every weapon did uh 1d6 damage and you were always rolling your d20s to hit and i said well if i'm skipping the to hit roll i'm just rolling damage you know how interesting can that be how much interest can i get out of that um so that's like that's why I, that's where i got the the simplicity for the game i i really aimed for what can i do with just a d6 um in the end, that wasn't enough. Uh, just rolling d6, doing that much damage, and then the next person's turn, that is not interesting. Uh, so it turned into like one die is one action, and you can use, uh, you have more than one at a time, and you can use your dice to uh, defend yourself as well. So it became a little bit of a give and take, push and pull. Um, the, the note you have about playing a gambit, 
mm-hmm. kind of suggests that there's a little bit of a risk reward kind of mm-hmm. push your luck element to it. You want to talk about that? So uh, I'm also, I also have grown increasingly interested in systems that, that inflict narrative harm more than numerical harm. Uh, rather than just doing uh, you know, five hit points of damage, even though that's where the game began, I became more interested in something where you take a wound to your leg and we begin to see how that impacts the rest of the session. Um, so one of the earlier iterations of the gameplay involved, uh, you do X many points of damage and the player chooses what that means, how that manifests as a wound. And uh, one of, uh, one of my good friends who was playtesting at the time noted how, how good it felt to have those wounds in the player's control. Um, and so I really liked that feedback and I tried to stick with that for the rest of the game's uh, development as much as I could. And in this case, um, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to put negative complications as a whole, not universally, because I think there are some times when they need to be imposed, but uh, I needed, I wanted to put those complications in the, uh, the player's hands. So when they want to risk some kind of negative complication, they take, uh, they take extra dice. They say what they're risking and depending on how bad it is, they take extra dice and uh, will add those to their role. Um, and that's really the best way to, to get really high results. Otherwise you can just keep kind of plinking at your, at your enemies and hoping for a good role or for luck. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one uh, question uh, also to ask, is there a favorite like NPC, like kind of society or person that you are really attached to in this system? So uh, in large part, I left the, the actual personalities up to the, the, the groups, the individual tables. Um, I imagine that uh, they will invent their own grave diggers that you'll meet up the well or that you'll meet hanging out at the grave digger bar. Uh, or if the, uh, the group gets interested in the politics of Bastion, which my group did eventually, then they'll meet you know elders or uh, ma- legal magistrates or things. Um, but I'd say uh, the the two names that I actually included in the game are Old Satchel, who runs the Gravedigger Bar, uh, and and uh, and she always uh, shares a drink with people on their way up the well. Um, uh, I, I, I like I think I wrote it in the book. She she pours out half a shot so that they have to come back and take the other half shot. Oh. Um, yeah, that felt very sweet to me too. Um, <laughs> and then there's there's uh, Mel, uh, the the gatekeeper who sits on the stairs guarding the gate upward uh, into the rest of the well from monsters who wander down the stairs. Who who is also kind of uh, paternal toward the uh, toward the grave diggers. So with the speaking of the grave diggers. Um... You know, the character sheet that you also showed, um, you know, has a lot of like, you know, make a selection from this list and then pick from this list and then pick from this list. You know, that plus some of the mechanic that you mentioned really does remind me of like Blades in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse. Some of the playbook materials there. Were those direct inspirations for anything that you were working on? Or is that more of a evolution in parallel kind of thing? As, as much of a, as I have a lot of respect for those games, I, I don't think I borrowed directly from them. The, the character sheet evolved directly from the, the process of playtesting. I just, I wanted to be able to sit down with people um, back in the before times when you could sit down with physical people and um, uh, start playing, start playtesting the game within five minutes or, or if lucky, you know, if unlucky, maybe 15. So I just printed out really rough checklists. I think I called them, you know, here, have a check sheet um, at the time. And I just slipped it across the table and said, you know, fill this out and we will get started. Um, I left as much information off the sheet as possible. So you don't know what it means to grab an ax versus a spear 
or necessarily who the well guard are versus the the miners guild um and so you can find all of that out in play uh if you're play testing with me, I would know all that, obviously. Or if you're reading the book for the first time, that information is all in the next several pages. Okay. Well, uh, well, actually, uh, I just read <laughs> that. Um, is there anything else that you really want to uh, share or, or, or talk about your game? Is there anything else that really excites you about it that you want people to know to get them jazzed to back it? I, uh, man, if I had the magical words that would make people excited about looking at this game, I would have been shouting them uh, all across the internet already. But uh, I don't know. I'm super excited to be sharing it with people. Finally, I'm really jazzed by the number of backers that have already signed up. It's super encouraging. I'm really grateful for all of them. Um, I, I know that I, I tossed uh, I tossed Marcus a couple uh, pictures. I don't know if he's been putting them up because um, because I think uh, I, I think the overlay is somewhat limited. Uh, oh, right okay. I don't know. I, I know that the the gravedigger picture that came up earlier was uh, is one of those that I sent him, uh, and I I love the look on her face. Uh, she's just kind of done with the done with everything, but still going back up the well. Um, and then the other one is probably my favorite set of monsters from the game that I just love describing to new players. Uh, bone bats, little infant skulls with hands attached um, with a, some sort of membrane between them that fly around that swarm you and try to make you feel really sad and bite you to death at the same time. I think you had, uh, you had me at in, uh, infant skulls. Uh, yeah. That's usually <laughs> it. That's it. It either. It either gets people into it or just chases them, chases them away. Uh, All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's always great to have a Kickstarter creator kind of on to talk about the passion of their project with their process behind it, things like that. Uh, it's also great to see you again, since it has been quite a long time since I think you and I have kind of talked directly. Uh, it so it was a good excuse sorry, to have you back on. We can fix that, Derek. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think the world right now is saying, no, we can't fix that. That's, uh, that's true. So we'll, we'll have to for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you got the... But thank you again for joining us. Uh, we certainly wish you luck on the project. Uh, we hope that you'll, some of the, the viewers may be really excited and come to back it as well. Uh, and maybe in the future, we'll have you back on again. Yeah. And they have oh, yes. eight days to do it too. Eight days, guys. So eight get on there. Days. I knew I forgot something. Eight days. Um, eight, eight days. Eight, seven days. Oh, wait, seven eight. days. <laughs> wait, is it? Okay. <laughs> But yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I hope I wasn't too verbose. No, no, it's good. It was great. I was, as, yeah. So uh, that was exciting. So like we said, we posted all the links uh, to the well inside our chat. So go support now that you know all of the nit and gritty and can <laughs> discover more for yourself. You just have to go ahead and pick up your own copy of the well. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Peter, for joining us. But um, as always, let's go ahead and announce our streaming schedule for this week. So uh, this week, all of these, by the way, are specific time. Or no, not specific. Pacific. Very Pacific specific times. times. <laughs> Very specific times. <laughs> times. Uh, so Monday at 6 p.m. Board games with the brothers Murph. Wednesday at 1:30 p.m. Uh, this game gets dicey. Uh, also to announce, hey, uh, sorry guys, Fireside is right now on a temporary hiatus. And but if you missed out on Fireside, especially hearing about the new voices in D and D, guess what? You guys can check out all the episodes down in our YouTube. Uh, they're all there. Uh, especially we want to go ahead and encourage people to look at the new voices for D&D &D because I think it's really exciting. Let's get new point of views. Let's get like, you know, all the fret, like like hearing the old and the, and the new kind of mixed together and create a new, better role-playing experience for everybody. Uh, so check that out. Uh, also, hey, guess what? This is the last table takes for the year. We are totally going on strike for 
Christmas and New Year's. Not at all. Just we're rising we up. To. We're rising we're up. <laughs> taking down the monarchy once and for all. I, the I workers are seizing I, the means of production. I don't think you can call it rising up when I told you you had a vacation. <laughs> It sounds nobler this You can't way. give us a vacation. We're rebelling. We're, We're rebelling. taking the vacation. We're You're not giving us vacation. anything. You don't give us the vacation. nothing. <laughs> so this is clearly the teenage years of the co is what I'm doing. <laughs> We're tired of the monarchy. Down with the monarchy. Flip yes. the tables. Uh, but yes, yeah, so all of you, I want to just t- tell you guys, stay safe. Uh, stay socially distanced if you can. Um, or just, you know, get the shot um, it, when it is available for those who can mm-hmm. have it. Uh, but yeah, like it's going to have an exciting holiday season. Uh, be safe uh, and such. And also, hey, don't forget to uh, follow, subscribe. Not only are we here live on Twitch, we're also on YouTube. And guess what? If you want to talk to us more, we got a Discord. So you can come in, hang out. Uh, and, and get together with your own uh, fellow Gen Card uh, nerdians uh, and uh, just like hang out. Thank you, uh, Isabella, Derek, and Abby uh, for joining. And also you guys in chat for joining us as well. Have a good season. We are gone. We'll see you in another year. Bye. <laughs> Isabella. <laughs> I'm suffering. I'm 